how to answer questions on part C of chemistry regents. And we're going to do that by going over the January 2019 part C exam questions. So pull up a chair, have a pen and, and a pencil or a, a, a piece of paper, your regents reference tables, calculator, and let's get to work. So we're looking here at questions 66 through 69 to start. And you'll notice that there is this paragraph and then a picture. And then, of course, the questions that follow. So if I scroll this down a little bit and we start taking a look at some of these questions. Alrighty. So 66, it says explain in terms of. So you're going to see that a lot. And when you do these short answers, of course, you got to make sure that your answer is specific to whatever the term or terms are. So it's asking why the mixture in the flask remains heterogeneous even after thorough stirring. So you want to remember what heterogeneous means. You're going to have a mixture that does not look the same throughout. And that's exactly what we have to do here. Now, let's take a look and backtrack what's actually in the flask. So there were three grams of sodium chloride, four grams of sand, and those two substances were put into 50 grams of water. Well, in terms of solubility, the sodium chloride dissolved, the sand did not dissolve. So that was the answer then for question 66. All right, let's go to question 67, based on table G. So right away, you want to grab your reference tables, turn to table G. And it's saying, state evidence that all of the sodium chloride in the flask would dissolve in distilled water at 20 degrees C. Well, when you go to table G, it is specific for type, um, not just types of solutes, but the amounts, the grams of solute that will fit in 100 grams of water. Now, in this problem, going back up to this paragraph, we're talking about three grams of sodium chloride in 50, well, that's a bad five, 50 grams of water. So let's get to table G at 20 degrees for sodium chloride and see what's happening. So 20 degrees, and I'm going to go up my 20 degree line. We want to hit sodium chloride, oop, which is right about here. And then, of course, we would go over and read the amount of sodium chloride that fits in 100 grams of water um, at 20 degrees. So it looks to be about 38 grams, definitely less than 40. Well, it's not in 100 grams of water. It was in 50. So when I take my 38 and I divide by 2, that's, it fits about 19 grams of sodium chloride in the water. Well, when I go back to the question, we only have 3 grams of sodium chloride. So certainly all of that will dissolve. So that's our answer to 67. Let's go to 68. So it says, describe a procedure to remove the water from the mixture that passes through the filter and collects in the beaker. The first thing you have to realize, of course, the sodium chloride is dissolved in the water, so both the sodium chloride and the water is going to pass through the filter, leaving the sand behind. So how do we remove the water? Real simple. We can evaporate the water. Of course, we could also uh, boil the solution and again get the water to separate faster or for that matter we could distill the water and separate the water from the salt. So any of those would be acceptable for quote-unquote describing a procedure. Now when you're answering questions, uh, short answer questions, don't forget you want to use sentence form, use full sentences please, um, no abbreviations, and at least the sentence Maybe, maybe two or three if you want, but really at least a sentence is good. All right, we got one more here in um, this group, and that is question 69. 
So it says the student reports that 3.4 grams of sodium chloride were recovered. Show a numerical setup for calculating the student's percent error. All right, so percent error shows up every regions. If I go over to the reference tables and I scroll down, I am going to find reference table T and show. Um, so should you, and here it is, percent error is right here. Let me do the free hand. So all we have to do is follow this to answer the question. So I'm going to go back. And I do want to point out to you, it's asking for a numerical setup. So a numerical setup just means that you're plugging the numbers into the equation. You don't have to solve. In fact, you don't, don't bother solving for the answer. So for percent error, I'm just going to show you here percent error is equal to, sorry, it's the measured value, that's the 3.4 minus the actual, which was the 3 or the 3.0, divided by the actual 3.0 times 100. Do not forget about the times 100. That is part of the numerical setup. All right, let's continue. Scrolling down here to the next page. Oh, so we have a graph here, and we have some information. It's helium gas in a rigid container with a movable piston, and we have the volume changing with temperature. So you see volume is on the y-axis, temperature is on the x, and it, this was done at a constant pressure. All right, so process the information, look at the graph, and now let's look at some of those questions. All right, determine the temperature of helium at a volume of 15 milliliters. So, of course, we're using the graph for that. So 15 milliliters, I'm just going to use my little pointer here, and it looks like it's crossing about there. And then what do I do? I go down and read it off of, of the graph. Now, when you have to use um, a graph, whether it's here on the test or on the reference tables, don't be afraid to mark up the test or the reference tables. In fact, do that. It's your test to use. It's your reference tables to use. Go for it. All right. Do not hesitate because the likelihood, especially, you know, you know, the, the question is done, you move on. But with the reference tables, more than likely, for example, solubil solubility curves, you're only going to use it once. I doubt more than that. So marking it up, it, it's not going to interfere with answering another question. All right, so the temperature here, now what I have to realize is that from 3 to 350, there was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 boxes. So every box then is 10 degrees Kelvin. And when I go ahead and do that, it looks to be about, I guess, 339. It's not quite 340. You answer 340, you're going to get credit anyway. The range on the answer key was from 334 to 341. So as long as a student answered within that range, you get the point. All right, if we go to 71 now, here again, we're explaining in terms of, and now this is in terms of particle volume. It says why the sample of helium cannot be compressed by the piston to zero volume. Well, real simple. Helium is made up of atoms. That's what they're talking about when they say particle. So the particles that make up helium, all right, are not going to go down to zero, right? Helium atoms are present, and they take up space, or they have volume. That's it. Let's keep going, and let's go on to the next one. All right, we got 72 and 73 here. And you notice this black line after 73. That, that tells you that's where 
using this graph or, or this set of questions ends. All right, so in 72, it says state what happens to the average distance between the helium uh, atoms as the gas is heated. Well, remember, the gas, is when it, anything is heated, the temperature is going to go up. If the temperature goes up, so does kinetic energy. So what happens to the distance between the atoms, obviously, it's going to increase. They're going to go ahead. It's also with the graph, it's, it's expanding, right? The volume is expanding. So obviously, it's because the gas particles are expanding. So all you have to say is that the distance between the helium atoms increases. All right, for 73, it says state a change in pressure that will cause the helium in the cylinder to behave more like an ideal gas. Any gas will behave most like an ideal gas with high temperature and low pressure. So for this question, all we needed to answer is that it would be low pressure. All right, so that takes care of this group of questions. Let's move on. So once again, we have a little paragraph here and we have an equation. And all of this information, of course, is associated with these next three questions. So let's take a, a look here. All right, so we're going to state one change in reaction conditions other than a catalyst that would increase the rate of reaction. All right, so what's going to increase the rate of reaction? Well, you just got to give one. Don't give more than one. You're just giving one. But certainly increasing the surface area of the zinc would be an example. Another example would be increasing the concentration of HCl because here it's AQ. So if I increase the concentration um, we're going to have more collisions, more collisions, more effective collisions, the faster the reaction. Same thing with exposing as much of the zinc, right? Increasing surface area. Another would be increasing temperature. So this is not a Le Chatelier's principle type question. This is not an equilibrium. There's only one arrow. So students might think, oh, well, energy is a product, so I better not say increasing temperature. But that's not true here. Remember that all reactions, including exothermic, require energy, known as activation energy. So increasing temperature would have been a good choice as well. One you can't use here is pressure, because your reactants do not have pressure here. You're, you're not dealing with a gas at the start. OK, let's go to 75. So in the answer booklet, there's a set of axes, and you need to draw a potential energy diagram for this reaction. So as we just said, right, energy is a product here, so that makes this reaction exothermic. So what does that mean? Well, let me just go ahead and put down a set of axes. We're going to start with the energy of our reactants higher than our energy of our products, but don't forget you have to draw in the um, – the activation energy. So what you see then is a good um, uh, representation of an exothermic potential energy diagram. All right. In 76, it's asking you to explain why this reaction will not reach equilibrium. Well, it's not going to be uh, reach equilibrium. Yeah, okay, the double arrows aren't there, but that's not going to be a good enough uh, answer, right? You have a gas and there's, it's not in a closed container, so what's going to happen? The gas is going to escape. Real simple. All right, so let's check out the next group of questions. Okay, so here we have oop, um, a paragraph again, and they're talking about a mixture of hydrocarbons. This is known as crude oil, and it's heated, and look at the different fractions that are collected based on the temperature. All right, here, Let's see what we get, there we go, All right? Temperature range depending on the carbon atoms in the molecules that are being separated. So let's check out the questions. In 77, determine the number of carbon atoms in one molecule of an alkane that has 22 hydrogen atoms 
in the molecule. All right, so an alkane. An alkane means all carbons, hydrogens, with the carbon, carbon bonds being all single bonds. Now there is on reference table, um, well actually what I wanted to say is on the reference table there are um, several that deal with hydrocarbons. So we want to go take a look. So we are taking a look here at organic reference tables. There is P, there is Q, and then on the next page is table R. So table Q deals with hydrocarbons. And what do you see? You see once again, the word alkane. Now we're dealing with 22 hydrogens. So we're dealing with this formula and you're asked to figure out how many carbon atoms than there is. Well, if H is equal to 22, and we want to figure out this value for N here for carbons, 22 is going to be equal to 2N plus 2. So it's not half like it would be for alkenes. It's almost half. So let's just do the math here. So if I subtract two from both sides, right, because that's what you do in algebra, you end up with 20 is equal to 2n, and then divide both sides by 2. So the number of carbon atoms was 10. So that answers question 77. Now we're going to question 78. So for 78, we're looking for the temperature range for the fraction that contains octane molecules. Well, you need to know how many carbon atoms there are in octane molecules. So once again, we need to go back to the organic reference tables. All right, here we are. And now we see the prefix oct. Right, so this is oct, and the number of carbon atoms is eight. The ANE ending just tells us it's all carbon, carbon single bonds. But the key is we know from this now we're dealing with eight. So now we got to go back and check out the table. Okay, so dealing with eight carbons, that's obviously between five and 12, so we would write the answer down as between 400 and 200 degrees Celsius. The last question, 79, we're drawing a structural formula for 3-ethyl hexane. So when we're drawing a structural formula uh, for any, again, molecule, you want to go back to those organic reference tables once again. So we're going to do that right now. So 3-ethyl hexane. Anytime you are going to draw the molecule or an organic molecule, you're going to work from the right back to the left. So the first thing here is that I have this ANE ending, which tells me I'm dealing again with an alkane. And I can kind of use this as an example. Now hex, that means, of course, I'm dealing with six. So I'm going to draw six carbon atoms across. So one two, three, four, five, and six. And then the three ethyl, well, the ethyl tells me I'm dealing with the two carbon branch and three means it's on the third carbon. So I can go ahead and just number the carbons from right to left. So the third carbon here, I can put two carbon branch. Now, with every carbon, there's hydrogens. That's why they're called hydrocarbons. And every car carbon atom has four valence electrons and it forms four bonds. So I need to fill in the rest of these, or not rest of these, but all of these carbons with the proper amount of hydrogens. So the end carbons are only using one bond, so I need to draw in three more. And I need to, of course, then attach the hydrogens here. The carbon here 
has used two, so I need two hydrogens. So I'm just adding hydrogens to get to four bonds for carbon. This third carbon is used up three, so it only gets one. The next one here in this chain gets two because it has two bonds already. Two because it has two bonds already. And of course, three here on the end again. And finally, on my branch, two. Lots of hydrogens, right? And then three again. Okay. You can't just draw the carbon chains without at least showing the, um, the rest of the bonds. If you don't throw all the hydrogens in, typically the answer key is okay with that. But don't not at least have down all of the lines representing all of the bonds. So that's how you draw an organic molecule. So let's go back to the rest of the questions. Okay, 80 through 82. We're almost done. Of course, when you take the regents, this is going to be, um, you know, where you really want to get done. You want to get ready to get started with the summer. I get it. But just hold on, be patient, get through the rest of these questions, stay focused. All right, so we have here a laboratory activity. Oh, we're dealing with a titration, right, because the student is titrating, and we have HCl and NaOH, and in question 80, it, you're asked to identify the positive ion in the sample of HCl. Well, the positive ion, sorry about that, um, of course, is H+. Now, how do I know that? Well, HCl is an acid, and all acids right, provide H plus in solution. On the reference table, there is a list of common acids and common bases. So anytime we're dealing with acid-base chemistry, um, you might want to look there. The other or the third reference table for acid-base chemistry is indicators. All right, let's move on to 81. It says show a numerical setup. So here we are showing the numbers again for calculating the concentration of hydrochloric acid using the titration data. All right, so let's go to reference table T. The titration equation is down towards the bottom of the page here. And of course it says titration, so of course you're not gonna miss it. It's not working, there you go. All right, so MAVA is equal to MBVB, and it even kind of goes through it with you, we'll go back and we'll work it out there. All right, so for 81, I got MAVA is equal to MBVB. Now what I like to do or have my students do, put the acid, it's HCl, above the acid side, the NaOH, which is the base, above the base side. And then it's just plugging in the values because this is for a numerical setup. So what do we have? We have 20 milliliters of HCl. So that's my volume. That's my 20. We have 0.25 molar NaOH. So that's the molarity of the base, 0.025. Okay. And then it says in one of the trials, it's 17.6 milliliters of the base. So that's the volume of the base, 17.6. And we want to figure out the molarity of the acid, and that is our X. So there is your numerical setup for the, um, the titration. Okay, let's go to 82. And in 82, it says the concentration of the base is expressed to what number of significant figures? Okay, so the concentration of the base is here. So all you're doing is writing down a number. Well, it's a number here less than one. So the way that we do scientific notation with any number less than one is you're gonna move from left to right and you're gonna find your first non-zero, which is the number two. You're gonna count two and you're gonna count anything to the right. So the number of significant figures here is only two. 
the zeros in front are called placeholders. So that's what you do with numbers less than one. Let's review the other two scenarios when it comes to significant figures. Significant figures wasn't showing up for a long time on, on the regents exams. Now it seems to be coming back just a little. So if you have a number greater than one and there is a decimal place, you count them all. Okay, if you have a number greater than one and there are zeros that are on the right, you're going to move from right back to left. And what you do is you find the first non-zero moving from right to left and count anything else to the left. It's, it's, the, it's the opposite move of if it's less than one. So 250 would be two sig figs. If 250 and there had been a decimal here, oops, I don't know what happened there, doesn't like me, uh, then we would have counted all of them. And if there's a zero in between two non-zeros, like 205, you would count the zero there. All right, so that was just a real short uh, reminder when it comes to uh, significant figures. And let's wrap up part C. For part C, questions 83 through 85, we have some nuclear chem questions going on here. Once again, we have a little paragraph of information and then a data table that's associated with it. All right, so 83, it says explain in terms of half-lives, right? So in terms of shows up again, why, um, what is this? Uh, radium-226 may have been used more often than the iso other isotopes in these paints. So we go back and it's talking about paints that glowed in the dark. Uh, they contain zinc sulfide and salts of radium-226. Um, as the radioisotope radium-226 decay, the energy release causes the zinc sulfide in the paints to emit life. And then you're given the half-lives. Well, if you take a look at the half-lives, notice that the half-life for radium-226 is much um, greater than the other radioisotopes. And there's your answer. That's all they wanted. All right, if we go ahead to 84, it says complete the nuclear equation in your answer booklet for the beta decay. Okay, so for beta decay, when you look at the answer booklet, the promethium is decaying by beta decay. And I know that because this is E minus here um, or minus one. There are also on the reference tables um, the names associated with the symbols. Well, in order to figure out what the product or the missing product is. I'm going to make a box. It's real simple. You're just going to add up the mass numbers on both sides. In other words, 147 is equal to 0 plus 147 and the bottom. So 61 is equal to a minus 1 plus what number? Now be careful. This is minus one, so it's gonna be 62. 62 minus one is 61, it is not 60. So sometimes students will do that and make a mistake. So it's 61 minus one equals, yeah, 62 rather, minus one, which is equal to 61, and this is samarium or SM. So just look up the identity on the periodic table. Well. This finishes part C of the January 2019 Regents exam. I hope that I was able to help you understand the part C questions a little bit uh, more and be able to answer them and understand why the answers were what they were for this part of the test and keep working hard. I have a lot of videos where I break things down according to topic. Check that out. Other explanations. Uh, leave me a comment below if there's something in particular that you're looking for a video to help you with. Give me a thumbs up. That would be greatly appreciated. And hey, if you haven't subscribed to my site, please do. Just keep working hard and good luck.